that's it. Okay, so we're on the redemption of the remnant, part three, God's long-term plan. So just to recap a little bit, in the first session, we saw that God's purpose in judging Israel was to bring them to repentance. We saw that it was a remnant that heard the word of the Lord and responded in the right way. In the second session, we saw that Babylon must fall. Babylon will fall. That God used his shepherd Cyrus to bring about the fall of Babylon. God is still using his shepherd Jesus to bring about the end of Babylon. Praise God. And we noted the connection between Babylon, Antichrist, and the worship of self. And no wonder God's shepherd brings Babylon down. And in both sessions, we observed God's foreknowledge, predestination, prophesying and planning, as, as well as the way he moved people and powers around like pieces on a chessboard in order to fulfill his purposes. And all this, despite the fact that each person involved could and did make their own decisions, their own choices. So. In this session, I want to look at the fall of Babylon and the return of the remnant from Daniel's perspective. What was it that God was trying to communicate to Daniel <clears throat> about the Jews, about Jerusalem, etc.? Uh, what is so special about 70? And uh, as I, I'm sure you know, the Lord loves mathematics. So just in passing, um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting muddled with my thing here. We'll see a little bit of God's mathematical symmetry, how it's a bit of a riddle, this one, how 490 became 70, and after that, 70 turns out to be 490, and within the sec second 70 is a 7, which is actually 49. Anyway, that's not such a serious point. But, uh, and... Possibly, if I go on longer than half an hour, we'd have a one-minute break in the middle to give your minds a few moments rest. Um, <clears throat> so the backdrop. Uh, instead of uh, Romans 8 this time, it's from Isaiah 39 and 40. As you know, in uh, 722 BC, um, Israel, the northern kingdom, had been conquered by Assyria. And the Israelites were exiled to Assyria. So this is Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. And he wanted to go further. He wanted to conquer Judah as well. It's all in the Bible. So Isaiah 36 tells the story of how Sennacherib boasts to Judah's king Hezekiah that he's going to conquer Jerusalem. I expect you remember that story. And Isaiah essentially says to Hezekiah, don't worry about him. There's no chance that he will take Jerusalem. That's all in chapter 37, Isaiah 37. And my very good Newbury Bible tells me that this all happened in 710 BC. Uh, the, date, the dates are not the most important thing here with regard to the point I'm trying to make. Late. Nevertheless, they are very interesting if Newbury has got it right. The... The main point to note here is that Assyria was the big regional, the big world power at the time. All other kingdoms were under Assyrian dominion, including the Babylonians. So then now we come to Isaiah 39 and 40. Now, according to my Newbury Bible, these chapters were written in about 712 uh, BC. That's two years uh, before uh, Sennacherib overthrew Jerusalem. Or, sorry, he didn't overthrow Jerusalem. He failed. <laughs> Two years before he tried to conquer Jerusalem and failed. So, as you know, events in, in Isaiah and other prophets are not necessarily in chronological order. So it tells us in verse 1 of chapter 39, I'm not going to read it all, but it's all here, I'm just going to say what it says. That tells us here that the son of the king of Babylon, 
uh, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, the king of Judah, because he'd heard he'd been sick. And you remember the story of the sickness is given in Isaiah 38. So it says here that Hezekiah was very pleased and he showed the Babylonian emissaries around. They saw all his treasures and so on. Then in verse three, Isaiah went to see Hezekiah and he asked him about the visitors. It's all here. And then in verse five, Isaiah prophesies this. Then Hezekiah, uh, Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Verse 8, so Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good, for he said, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. So what do we learn from this? The first thing I think is that it would be Babylon, not Assyria, that would conquer Judah and Jerusalem. God had said it. So it's no wonder Isaiah was so confident two years earlier when Sennacherib was trying to uh, conquer Jerusalem. Uh, he'd known for two years that it wouldn't happen, unless I'm getting my dates mixed up, but anyway. The second thing is the, the Babylonian conquest, conquest of Judah and Jerusalem would be devastating. He said, everything, that is all the great treasures, everything of any value from Jerusalem would be taken to Babylon. Remember it said nothing would be left in Jerusalem. And the third thing we learn is that some of Hezekiah's descendants, the royal seed would be taken to Babylon and they would serve in the king of Babylon's palace. And this is Isaiah prophesying 712 BC or whatever it was. And it all happened, tells us in Daniel chapter one, verses three to six. Uh, then the king of Babylon instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom, were, uh, in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans and so on. We know all this, don't we? It's very familiar to us, but let me read verse six. Now from among those <clears throat> of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, the famous four. Uh, they had their names changed into Babylonian names, but it was, it was these uh, four. So they, they went to serve in the king of Babylon's palace and they served very well. But back to Isaiah. So we read at the end of Isaiah 39, the, the prediction that Jerusalem would fall to Babylon. And then straight away in, in Isaiah 40, also written in 7.1.12 BC, the same year as Isaiah 39, God says, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and, and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. It seems to me that God is already talking about the end of the Babylonian captivity. In essence, he's saying it's, it's finished. Jerusalem has been punished by the Lord and now her sin is forgiven. As we've seen before in his foreknowledge, God sometimes speaks as, of, of future things as if they have already happened. But Isaiah uh, carries on, God carries on. Uh, verse, is this, anyway, verse three, isn't it? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, 
make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Again, familiar scriptures, every valley shall be filled, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So from our perspective, we know that this is talking about John the Baptist. Uh, he was the voice crying in the wilderness. He is saying, prepare the way of the Lord, a highway for our God. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. He is saying, God is coming. Wonderful, isn't it? God is coming. He is coming. And of course, he came in our Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the point I'm trying to make is this that Hezekiah and all the other Jewish kings and the Jews were concerned about kingdoms and conquests, the land, Jerusalem, the temple, and so on. And they were hearing from God how it was all going to unfold in the future. But God was looking further forward. He was looking at the real thing. Jerusalem, the land, the temple, the people, the ethnic Jews, that's not the real thing. Those are just to help us all, including the Jews, to understand what the real thing is. The real thing is, is the Messiah coming. The real thing is God coming in Christ. The real thing is God coming into his real temple, his new covenant people. Uh, God showed this to Isaiah. And I believe he showed it to Daniel as well. This, we're talking about God's long-term plan. So coming to Daniel, uh, Daniel had been taken when he was about 14 years old with his three friends and others from Judah, from Jerusalem to Babylon in 605 BC, uh, which was the first time Nebuchadnezzar attacked and conquered Jerusalem. As far as we know, he never returned to Israel, but he remained faithful, fearless, and uncompromising throughout his life. It, it's a fact, of course, that he served under the kings of Babylon and Persia, but really he served the living God and him alone. He is a great example to us of how to live in Babylon under the rule of Antichrist, if you like, but without compromise or fear. Even when one holds big positions in Antichrist government, as we mentioned last time. In 539 BC, Babylon fell to Cyrus and Daniel was there. By the way, in the dates I sent out, I made a mistake. I said that uh, Cyrus came to power uh, uh, the king of the Medes Persians in 600 BC. Actually, that was when he was born, apparently. So anyway, it's, it's just a small point. Obviously, he wasn't king that day. So then, 539 BC, then Cy Cyrus issued his decree that the Jews should go back to Jerusalem to build the temple. And as you know, Zerubbabel and company returned. That's about 536 BC. And in 5. 36 BC, they laid the foundation of the new temple. So you've got 605 BC to 535 BC, that is 70 years. So that's one possibility for Jeremiah's 70 years of captivity. And then the Jews fiddled around a lot and so didn't complete the building of the temple for another 20 years. It was finished in 516 BC. It had been destroyed in 586 BC. So again, that's, that's 70 years between those two dates. That's another possibility. Uh, perhaps both are, are correct. And also note, note the connection in each case between the 70 years and the temple. But to come back to my riddle at the beginning, why did God decide on 70 years of captivity? Well, it tells us in 
2 Chronicles 36. I'm not going to read it all, but it essentially says here that the, the Israelites have gone into exile, and we, we, we follow up on the blue bit, uh, to fulfill the, the word of the Lord, verse 21, by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. It was the 70 years was so that the land could enjoy her Sabbath. But what, what does this mean? God had warned the Israelites centuries before through Moses that if they didn't behave, the land of Israel would spew them out, which of course is what eventually happened. And God said it's there in Leviticus 26, 43. The land also shall be left empty by them and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. God, <clears throat> in his foresight, he saw it all. So, um, the, uh, as we know, the, God, God had commanded the Israelites to let the land have a Sabbath every seventh year. But is, Israel didn't do that for centuries. Seventy years of Sabbaths must represent 490 years during which the Israelites didn't keep this command. Uh, that's what I meant when I said 490 years became 70 years. And of course, if they didn't do that, if they weren't keeping those Sabbaths, then they can't have been keeping the year of Jubilee. So there was no liberty being proclaimed. There was no release for slaves, knowing, no going back to one, one's God-given inheritance and so on. But carrying on with Daniel then, in Daniel chapter 5, verse 30, um, which, which was written in about 538 BC. So that's the year after 539 BC when Babylon fell to Cyrus. Uh, it, it records the fall of Babylon through Cyrus. So it says here, that very night Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. And uh, just remember, I said Cyrus was born in 600, so that makes him about 62 at this time. Of course, it gets a bit complicated to follow here because uh, in this verse, Cyrus is called Darius. Um, but it was definitely Cyrus, not King Darius. You know, there was a King Darius or perhaps several, but there was one who came a few years later. So he was around at the time of Haggai. He came to the throne in 522 BC. So why did Daniel call uh, Cyrus Dar uh, Darius? Um, in fact, Daniel calls Cyrus Darius in, in chapter 6 as well. And at the beginning of chapters 9 and chapter 11, he never uses the name Cyrus. So I'm not actually going to answer the <laughs> question because... Um, it deflects from the, the main story here, and the technical bits might not be of interest to everyone. Um, but sufficient to say, firstly, it isn't a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes in his book. Uh, secondly, there are explanations, although there are at least two possibilities of why it's, it's written like this. And thirdly, it's possibly not that important, although... Uh, to people like me, it seems important. People like me like to sort all these details out. But if there, if there are those who are interested and would like to go through it, we can do it later uh, after this session or some other time. So shortly after the conquering of, um, of Babylon, Cyrus released the Jews to go back to Israel and Jerusalem. That's what we keep saying. That's what we read in Ezra 1 at the beginning of the first uh, session. And at the time uh, Babylon fell, Nabonidus was the king of Babylon. Now, Nabonidus, he'd become very unpopular. Uh, <clears throat> that also made it much easier for Cyrus to conquer Babylon. Uh, however, Daniel tells us, that on, on the day Babylon fell, Belshazzar was the king of Babylon. So some of the experts, historians, 
used to say that Daniel had got it wrong. They, they said he was simply wrong. They said there never was a Babylonian king, Belshazzar, because the last king of Babylon was Nabonidus, uh, which is correct. And also they had found no reference to Belshazzar, a king, or even Belshazzar as a person outside of the Bible. But they were wrong. Praise God. Nabonidus, Nabonidus was king of Babylon in 539 BC when Babylon fell. However, he, were, he was not there. In fact, he had not been there for a very long time. It said that this is one of the reasons the Babylonians were fed up with him. He was off trying to conquer the rest of the world and that sort of thing. At the time of Cyrus's conquest against Babylon, he was actually in the area we call Saudi Arabia, I think. He was worshipping the, the moon god Sin. I didn't quite know the right pronunciation, Sin, something like that, the moon god. But that's another reason, apparently, why the Babylonians didn't like Nab Nabonidus, because he wasn't a faithful Marduk worshipper. Uh, Marduk was the chief god of the Babylonians. And <clears throat> some historians say that the people of Babylon actually welcomed Cyrus's soldiers right into the city with open arms. Because Cyrus, it turns out, was a serious Marduk worshipper. Uh, that's, that's one reason why the, the, the Babylonians liked him. But Nabonidus had made his son Belshazzar co-regent some years before. In fact, it was 553 five, BC. So in practice, Belshazzar was ruling Babylon. He was the king of Babylon. And he was there when Babylon fell. And all the experts have realized all of this now and found the evidence for it. It all came out through an archaeological survey some time ago, made in 1854, if you're interested, by the British consul in Basra, uh, J.E. Taylor. By the way, if you like all this sort of stuff, uh, the place to go is the, um, the British Museum. And you can get this book, I don't know if you can't see it very well, but this is called uh, Through the British Museum with the Bible. And the British Museum is like a commentary on the Bible, uh, many parts of it. So this man, Taylor, he found what's now called the, the Cylinder of Nabonidus in southern Iraq. Now, this isn't the same as the famous Cyrus Cylinder, if you've heard of that one. We'll do that another time. It looks much the same, but it isn't the same thing. But on it, Nab Nabonidus is praying to his gods. And at one point he says this, as for Belshazzar, the eldest son, the offspring of my heart, the fear of thy great divinity, cause to exist in his heart and let not sin possess him. Let him satis be satisfied with fullness of life. So he referenced his son, Belshazzar. So rather than undermining the, the veracity of Daniel, this all shows just how accurate Daniel is in the way he records things. When Daniel was brought before Belshazzar to interpret the writing on the wall, you remember in chapter 5, uh, Belshazzar said to him, it's in verse 16, chapter 5, uh, now, if you're able to read the writing and reveal its interpretation to me, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold put around your neck. And you shall have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. So why did he say that? Why did he say third ruler? Why didn't he offer him second ruler? It's because he himself was the second ruler in the kingdom. His father was number one. He was number two. It was the best he could offer. And that's what happened. It says in verse 29, uh, it says that, uh, I'm not reading it all, a proclamation concerning him that was issued declaring that he, Daniel, now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't last very long because <clears throat> within a few hours, um, 
Belshazzar was no longer king. Cyrus had conquered the city. But anyway, it's tremendous, isn't it, that God's word always gets it right. Praise God. And, of course, the Bible is the word of God. It, it will always be right. It will always be right. Uh, the Bible is God-breathed. It, it cannot be wrong. That isn't to say that we cannot misunderstand or misinterpret it. Of course, we can. Uh, but if we start out with the presupposition that the Bible is right, we, we will find that the available data, if it's correct, will always fit uh, the view that the Bible is right. So Daniel tells us in chapter 5 that Belshazzar and his friends are having, they're continuing with their extended party. They thought, I said last time, they thought they were safe in Babylon, that Babylon could not fall and so on, uh, even though there was this outside threat from Cyrus. But God, in his mercy and grace, is this famous story, he sends them a message, some writing on the wall. Meanie, meanie, tackle you farzen. And so all the wise men, the astrologers, etc., all the experts are clueless. They, they can't read it or interpret it. So Belshazzar calls for Daniel because Belshazzar has heard that Daniel's done that sort of thing before. And he knows, he's heard that the, this is how it's put in verse 14, the spirit of, of, of the gods is in him, in Daniel. And God gives Daniel the interpretation. Verse 26, this is the interpretation of each word. Meaning? God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Uh, I think it's a tremendous, uh, wonderful and gracious message, but very terrifying. But it was exactly, if you think about it, it was, it was exactly the message needed at that time. God was telling Belshazzar and many of his officials, it's all over. And within a few hours, you will most likely be dead. So the Lord, in his grace, was giving them a final chance to get right with him before they died. Perhaps some there did, we don't know. Perhaps they sought out Daniel and his friends and urgently asked them, how do I get ready to meet the living God? Tell me what to do. And perhaps some of them found peace with God that night. But, of course, we, we have to face the reality that those who spend their whole lives ignoring, neglecting, and dismissing the word of God are not in a good frame of mind to listen on the day when God speaks to them in all urgency, perhaps with a terrifying message. So, Probably many there scoffed. They continued to believe that Babylon could and never fall because she, Babylon, says in her heart and she boasts, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow and will never ever see mourning or experience grief. That's the spirit of Babylon. That's a quote from, as you know, Revelation 18, verse 7. But it, it's tremendous folly, isn't it? Everyone dies. Everyone is on the, 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 the brink of eternity. Everyone. But what amazing compassion from God that he should send such a message which shook them to their core. It says, when the writing appeared on the wall, uh, in verse 6, Daniel 5, 6, then the, the kings, that is Belshazzar's face, it grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him. Uh, the joints and muscles of his hips and back weakened and his knees began knocking together. He was in shock. Praise God <laughs> that he was in shock. God didn't say to him, I love you, Belshazzar. God told him what he needed to hear. The Lord was making a, a final attempt to waken him and them out of slumber to wake them up to reality. Wonderful. I think that is great and marvelous love.
Amen. Now, I did say I'd have one minute's break at uh, after half hour, so I'm going to pause the rec- Babylon. Daniel, it says, has been reading Jeremiah 29, possibly Jeremiah 25 as well. And it says in verse two here uh, that Daniel understood, here it is, understood by the books, the number of <clears throat> the years specified of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. We've got 70 coming up again. So Daniel possibly or probably working out that the end of the 70 years is fast approaching, he sets himself to pray and fast about this for some time. He prays. He didn't just say, well, God, has said it, so it's going to happen, he prayed. And at the end of his prayer, the Lord sends the angel Gabriel to speak to Daniel and to tell him about future events to do with the Jews. Daniel has been praying about 70 years, but Gabriel tells Daniel about 70 weeks or 77s. The word weeks can be translated uh, sevens. So, of course, 70 Sevens is 490. So now you're getting the link where 70 becomes 490. The other, the other one was 490 became 70. Now 70 is becoming 490. This is my arithmetical riddle. Well, it's the Bible arithmetical riddle. And uh, this, this prophecy in Daniel, I must admit, is one of my favorites because it's, it's astonishing. It's startling. It's very significant. It's far-reaching. Um, one of the one of the great prophecies in the Bible, and it actually tells when Messiah would come into the world. And of course, as predicted, Jesus came right on time. So I don't want to be distracted by all all the details of this prophecy today. And in any case, I expect everyone here knows all about it. But I'll just make one or two points. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is praying for his people, the Jews. He's thinking and praying about the end of the 70 years when God had promised that the the Jews would return to the land of Israel as per Jeremiah 29. But it's as if the Lord says to him through the angel Gabriel, listen, Daniel, here you are praying about your people with fasting and sackcloth and ashes, that's verse 3, and you've been confessing the sin of your people, that's chapter 9, verse 5, and you've seen rightly that the problem has been sin. You've understood that it's because Israel rebelled against me, consistently broke my laws, and departed from my precepts and judgments, that I brought righteous judgment and destruction on Israel and drove them out of the land. So you've prayed and asked me to turn aside my wrath. And you said, I'm going to read a verse here, I think. Yes, verse 17. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. And you've prayed for the city which is called by my name, verse 18. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. So Daniel, this is still, I'm I'm putting words in God's mouth. Sorry about this. So Daniel, here is the answer to your prayer. I'm going to show you how it's all going to work out long term. You are fixated on the people, the Jews, the land of Israel and Jerusalem and the temple. But your returning to the land is not going to fix things. Building Jerusalem and the temple is not going to fix things. But I'm going to show you now that things are going to be fixed, and I'm going to show you how they are going to be fixed. And I'm going to tell you when they will be fixed. 
So coming back to verse 24, it says 70 weeks are determined for your people and your holy city. In other words, <clears throat> once these 70 weeks, these 77s uh, are over, in some way, it will all be finished in some way, as far as your people, the Jews, are concerned. Now, everyone agrees, whatever their views about prophecy, that um, it's talking about weeks of years. So one week is seven years, one day is one year. So 77s makes 490 years. So what's going to happen? It says here, 70 weeks are determined on your people to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. He, he specifies six things. And I would argue, not everybody agrees with this, but I would argue that all these things were fulfilled by Jesus when he came, he died, he rose again, he ascended and sent the Holy Spirit when he inaugurated the new covenant. The, the first three here, starting it to finish the transgression, uh, um, to make an end of sin, and so on, these three, I, I, think, I think that's uh, easy uh, to see fulfilled in, in Jesus. Uh, the fourth, uh, to bring in everlasting righteousness. I think that's seen in the, in the shedding of the blood of Jesus as well as in the coming of the, the new covenant. And then it says to seal up vision and prophecy. So what can that mean? But mightn't it be referring to the fact that Jesus is God's, in one sense, Jesus is God's final word, as Hebrew 1 verse 1 indicates. And then it says and to anoint the most holy um, or it's actually it could be that can be, be most people think it's better translated to anoint the most holy place. So what does that mean? What is God's most holy place? Where is God's most holy place? Uh, it's in the holy of holies in the in the temple. Um, but of course that is only a picture of the true. The real place is in heaven in God Himself. Or alternatively, we might say the real place is his new covenant church. The church is his temple. He anointed his temple on the day of Pentecost. His most holy place is anointed. Praise God. And then he carries on. Um, here in verse 25 and verse 26, Gabriel sets out God's timetable for this. Uh, Without going into all the details, he says there will be 69 weeks until the Messiah comes. That's following the, the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Then there'll be 69 weeks. Look, there's seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 69 weeks. So 69 weeks is 483 years. He says 483 years after the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, the Messiah will come. And then in verse 26, he says, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. He's going to die for others. And then in the middle of verse 27, let's see if I've got it. Yes. He says, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now, I know I'm missing out all the details, but I know there's some people here who know a lot about this. So in God's foreknowledge he's laying out a timetable very clearly and once it is completed as far as the Jews are concerned in some way it would all be done and dusted if you like we just need to find the starting point and we can work it out and so again without going into any details and there are a lot of details uh, which I'm happy to go through with those who are interested. We, we went through some of it in a men's meeting about a year ago. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the command to rebuild Jerusalem, because it's got to be 483 years after the command to rebuild Jerusalem is, is, is given. Uh, 
the command to rebuild Jerusalem is in three parts. Uh, Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes. Those are all kings of Persia. But Artaxerxes finished it. That's what I'm suggesting. Uh, this one here. And therefore, many people take the 69 weeks, the 483 years to start from there. Um, again, we're not going to go into all these, certainly not at, uh, at the moment. But if you take this, this decree was in 457 BC, it's, it's mentioned in Ezra chapter 7. And if you take um, 483 years on from there, and you, and you have to add one on a one because there's no not BC and not AD, you actually get to 27 AD. And sorry to have all this arithmetic, but it's all good for us and very interesting, of course. I mean, what can be more interesting than a bit of mathematics, apart from the Bible, of course. So 27 AD is the, is the year it is generally reckoned that Jesus began his ministry. So the timetable works uh, perfectly. So he says, as we mentioned in verse 26, that Messiah should be cut off, but not for himself. He says in verse 27, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and, and offering. So the middle of the week, of course, is after uh, middle of a seven is three and a half. And three and a half years after Jesus began his ministry, um, Jesus was cut off. He died for sin. This was the final sin offering. Um, he, he, in that sense, he brought an end to sacrifice and offering. And so I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is a little chart somebody made. You've got your 457 BC here. That is uh, Ezra 7. You've got your, your 69 weeks up to here. That's seven weeks plus 62. That's 483 years. Then you've got the, the, this last week here, making the 490 years, the 70 weeks. You've got 27 AD, Jesus' ministry starts, 31 AD, 30, 31 AD is Jesus crucified. And then you've got these other three and a half years. So following the resurrection and the day of Pentecost, the gospel was preached only to Jews for three and a half years. And then that culminated with the, the stoning of Stephen, it says down here. And after that, the gospel began to be preached to Gentile and, and Jews, of course, uh, but it went to the Gentiles. So from then on, God's people were now the one new man in Christ. Uh, the body of Christ comprised of both Jew and Gentile. And so everything determined for Daniel's people, the Jews had happened within the 70 weeks, the 490 year period Gabriel, Gabriel specified. It was a, a new age, the age of the new covenant, the age of the church. There was a new temple, the body of Christ. There was a new priesthood. All believers in Christ are his priests. There was a new place to worship. It was anywhere and everywhere. It was in God. So <clears throat> after 490 years in the way described, things ended for the Jews. I'm not talking about other aspects of prophecies to do with Israel and so on. The new had come for both Jew and Gentile. <clears throat> now, in the Bible, the Number 49 is, of course, very significant. Uh, what is even more significant, perhaps, is what comes after 49, which is, of course, 50. So Pentecost means 50 days. It's 50 days after Passover, 50 days after the cross. The year of Jubilee, Jubilee came in the 50th year. Then the trumpet sounded. Liberty was proclaimed. Slaves were set free. Everyone returned to their God-given inheritance. Praise God. So is it uh, stretching things too much to think that the, the choice of 490 by God was so that we could make this link? In other words, after the 490 years, 
after Daniel's 70 weeks, would that be the age of glory, if you like, <clears throat> Pentecost, the year of Jubilee, and so on? Um, the church age, glory in the church, the age of the spirit. This is, of course, the age we live in. But that's not quite the end of the story. In a quirk of history, in 533 AD, so we're skipping way ahead now, uh, a, a certain abbot who worked for one of the popes uh, made a mistake in his calendar calculations because of some information he didn't have at the time. Again, I'm not going to go into the details, but his calendar was universally adopted right up to the present day. It's still the one we use. Uh, we, but it means that because we use that calendar, Jesus was actually born in 4 BC, not in 1 AD. But because of that, amazingly, it means that the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans was in AD 70. You've got 70 coming up again. Now, you might say to me, well, that's just coincidental or whatever, but there you go. Um, but what's interesting is that Jesus prophesied in his teaching several times about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And it seems to have been quite a big thing in the Lord's mind. So why? The original Jerusalem temple, that Solomon's temple, was totally destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. This is what we've been talking about. And then it was rebuilt by Zerubbabel and company and completed 70 years later in 516 BC. That's what we will come on to. But this temple of Zerubbabel, um, which had been vastly improved and expanded by Herod the Great and company, uh, was totally destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Not one stone was left upon another, just as Jesus had predicted in Matthew 24. It was total destruction of the temple. Today, all we see left is the Temple Mount, which is very impressive itself. I mean, I know Les and many people have been there and visited it some many times. Uh, I've only seen pictures of it, and that's impressive enough. Uh, it's a massive structure that Herod built around that Zion area so that he could, he could make his magnificent temple, one of the wonders of the world, I think. So why did God allow the temple to be so totally demolished and destroyed? Why was this event so important for Jesus? Um, I think it's because God was sending a message loud and clear. He was saying, you are now in the age of the real. You no longer need the symbols of the real. You've got the real thing. The new covenant had come into being in about AD 30. But the old covenant system had carried on alongside it in Jerusalem for 40 years. There was the temple there still running. There was the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. Uh, there were the offerings and the sacrifices and, and so on. But God had been telling the Jews in those 40 years that that system is obsolete. Uh, get into the real thing. Get into the new covenant. And, of course, the book of Hebrews is all about this. After AD 70, the old covenant was no longer fun functional. It couldn't be because there was no temple, no priesthood, no offerings, etc. It's the same right up to uh, today. <clears throat> then, as if to underline the point, in the in the seventh century AD now, seventh century AD, the, the 600s. God allowed Jerusalem to fall to the Muslims, who put uh, a sacred Muslim shrine, the Dome, Dome of the Rock, on top of the Temple Mount, as we know, which is still there to this day. In practice, that made it impossible for another Jewish temple to be uh, rebuilt there. I know there are some Christians, evangelicals, that believe that the third temple will be built there uh, because of their eschatological viewpoint. But I'm not getting into all that today. Personally, I don't think it will happen. 
but I may be wrong. So I've, I've virtually come to an end, but just let me uh, summarize and conclude. We've been talking about God's long-term plan, and I hope I've been able to, to explain it and, and show it to you. Um, so his long-term plan was the coming of the Messiah, God's coming, the new covenant, uh, the spiritual fulfillment of the, the year of Jubilee and God coming to his temple. And for us, we, we have the, the privilege of living in the days when it is all happening, when it has been happening for the last 2,000 years approximately. It started on the day of Pentecost. It continues up until today. Amen. That's God's long-term plan, the redemption of the remnant. Let's pray, and then if there are comments or questions or whatever, uh, we, can, we can do that. Father, we do thank you for your wonderful word and for what you've been aiming at. You've been aiming at uh, yourself coming the whole time, coming in in Christ, coming into your temple, coming through the new covenant so that we can uh, be cleansed of our sin we can you can fix things in your people and lord we can enjoy you forever amen okay i don't know if graham's around back to <laughs>